start the recording. Recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And this is part 20 in our series of libraries in response. Uh, we started in late March in response when, um, uh, when things were getting intense uh, to ask this basic question about what is a library if the building is closed. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very different way of thinking about what is a library than we normally do. And that led to a series of questions or aspects related to that, like internet access and digital services and physical materials. And then as a result of a presentation we had from a librarian in uh, Denmark, uh, talking about the role of the library in the, in the social cohesion of the community, we go, uh, we added uh, social infrastructure to that group. Uh, of course, an obvious thing in retrospect. That's not the entire course, scope of what is a library. It's just a simple taxonomy we've used to uh, address the question and have people come in and speak. And we've repeated these uh, nearly every week since late March, and now we are at number 20, uh, amazingly. Um, these are hosted and recorded by our partner, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutes, IFLA, IFLA.org, out of uh, Brussels, and at the controls of Stephen Weiber uh, there, who will uh, keep us on schedule, handle muting, take notes, uh, monitor chat questions that I miss and generally take care of us all. And so thank you, Stephen, again, for uh, working on this. So we've got uh, two, two great guys, two self-professed extroverts with us today, uh, John Bracken and Stephen Abram, uh, the executive director of uh, the Digital Public Library of America and the executive director of the Federation of uh, Ontario Public Libraries. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, an open collaboration of libraries doing interesting things with technology. Most of our work from the past few years has been around the use of wireless technologies to extend library Wi-Fi, in a word, or access to the library's digital services, most of which are access to the internet, but not only, of course, it's all the other things that people uh, want uh, uh, when they go online from the library directly. Uh, I guess the most popular thing that people want is, is access to the open internet, but they also want uh, you know, the different kinds of digital materials. Uh, they may even want to communicate directly with the librarian. Uh, not to mention all the other public information, public services that people rely on. In the U.S., uh, before the pandemic, one in three adults access the internet at a public library. It's an astonishing number. That's, that's like 14 and over, not counting the smaller kids that, that do that too, is roughly 80 million people. Uh, of course, most of those, of course, had other sources of the internet, but something about the library the speed, it's comfortable, it's quiet, it's safe, uh, drew people there uh, to, to access that service. Now, with the building is closed, nearly all the libraries have, have turned their Wi-Fi routers out to the window to try to extend coverage outside of the building uh, in the US. Different countries are in different stages, as we'll hear from Stephen uh, Abram. Uh, but in the U.S., very few libraries are open. A few have begun to try to open tentatively, as many of you know and have testified for us. Uh, but uh, right now, the parking lot is your, is your main option for access to the, uh, the Internet at a library. Um, our goal, I guess I could call it, that uh, uh, Stephen Weiber and I have been developing in a partnership, uh, Partnership for Public Access, is this idea of universal public access. That is to say that everyone should be near uh, some kind of an access station, and the library is the ideal entity, the ideal institute, institution to provide that service. More than, more than anyone else, we would, we would say the, the library is the natural face of e-government. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and not only just as an access point, but as a, as a guide, as a curator of, of this whole range of, of massive uh, digital information. This access station, think of it as a combination of these uh, different attributes here, a phone booth, uh, an emergency call box, a, a government kiosk and library Wi-Fi. And should be, should be close to everybody, you know, and not just for, you know, logging on, but for when something happens, when, you know, there's some kind of an outage, uh, electrical or the internet or uh, various kinds of emergencies. Uh, this is a sign we would like to see everywhere. We're going to get into this topic, not today, but at a, at a future date. Uh, just to remind everybody that, that the pandemic is not the only uh, crisis that uh, we're facing uh, and that libraries are responding to. Uh, we think of libraries, we don't think of them, they actually are uh, responders, so-called second responders uh, in a whole range of uh, circumstances. And this chart demonstrates our, our traditional disasters, our normal disasters, if you will, uh, which are increasing rapidly and severely. Case in point here, uh, where I am in California, we've got 370 wildfires. These are, these are big fires, not just little ones, they're more than that, uh, uh, raging across the state. Uh, tens of thousands of people have been evacuated and, uh, and you know, it's gonna be a million acres easily before this thing is over. That's, that's California's reality. We haven't even talked about earthquakes. Uh, this uh, Dureco blew through uh, Iowa and wiped out 40% of the, of the uh, corn crop in, in Iowa. I mean, and, and this is not like a hurricane where you, you're tracking it for a few days. This thing just developed within a matter of hours. Uh, a phenomenal uh, 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 event, you know, winds of 140 miles an hour, just awful. Uh, there have been massive floods through the, through the Midwest in, the, in recent years, too. Uh, and then uh, the, the level of the heating uh, oceans are triggering these uh, huge storms. Right now, uh, as of this morning, they're predicting two hurricanes hitting the Gulf, more or less at the same time. I mean, it's never happened before, but a lot of things that have never happened before are happening now. So. The point of this is planning, trying to understand and prepare for how libraries will respond to these different kinds of emergencies and disasters. So with that happy note, we'll turn to our presentations and our speakers. Uh, first up is uh, John Bracken, uh, the Executive Director of uh, DPLA uh, for several years now. Uh, I, I poached this quote from a talk or a presentation he gave several years ago, uh, guiding the early stages of formation of DPLA, what I thought was just an outstanding uh, mission, really. And I don't know, uh, I want to hear if that's, if that's real stage mission and how, how closely you've adhered to it. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll, hopefully we'll have some time for some questions before we have our second speaker, Stephen Abram, uh, the Executive Director of the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries. And his, uh, his offering today is that libraries are not seeking a new normal, we're inventing the next normal, uh, a long tradition of adapting. And so if there's an attribute besides empathy that uh, libraries and librarians uh, possess, it, it's adaptability. And so it's certainly a, ch a challenge today for adapting to all these circumstances. How do you adapt to having a closed library, for example, uh, and the rest of it? So we'll be looking forward to, to uh, hearing from Stephen on how things are going in Ontario. So for now, we will uh, turn it over to John Bracken. John, thank you for coming and uh, take it away. Thank you, Don. Um, luckily, for all of us, that quote is still pertinent and maybe more pertinent than ever, the notion of educating, informing, and empowering. So I, I'll just share with you uh, uh, who I am and what Digital Public Library of America is. I'll share with you what I've been hearing from the field, from our friends and partners in the field. And then I'll share with you how we're adapting. Everything Don just said and everything we had, I heard in the chit chat leading up to this and what I've seen in the chat room here 
is, you know, we're, we're in the same page and we're all, there's no guidebook, there's no textbook to make sense of this moment. Um, for us at, at DPLA, as, as Don said, uh, our mission, our grounding over the nearly 10 years since we've been conceived is to maximize access to, to knowledge in a digital context, to really focus on the United States libraries, archives, and museums, and, the, and, and being a bridge, a digital bridge for that richness, and free access, right? Which is one of the things you saw in the quote that, that Don shared, the notion of being an open platform, an open network. Um, you know, how we, what that means in, and, and uh, there you go, and openly available materials. Um, how we implement that, and you know, we focus on empowering institutions and communities. In particular, we've been focused on stories and narratives and communities that have traditionally not been part of projects like ours, that have not been part of national efforts like ours. Um, and, and we're driven by three core beliefs that we articulate. One is, uh, and this is sometimes a uh, challenging uh, thesis to put out, but that technology has the potential for being uh, a liberatory force and we need to apply it as such. We believe that digital can leave us more engaged as humans. We believe it can leave it us, give us greatest, greater access to knowledge, not more restricted knowledge. And, and we think uh, the possibilities are greater than, than where we're starting for the future, greater than where we are today. Uh, second, as I noted earlier, we believe we really need to be conscious about building bridges and working uh, in an inclusive fashion so that we are not, we know that projects like ours historically have not, in often cases, have either intentionally or unintentionally excluded narratives and populations um, and we are, in order to counteract that, we're focused on, tel on telling different types of stories and building different types of relationships than traditionally projects like ours too often have done. And that frankly, that we traditionally did in our first 10 years. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in manifest near the end. Um, and everything we do is a partnership. So if you go to dp.la right now, I don't know the exact number, but you'll see a, you know, a set of collections, uh, a set of 40 million digital materials. None of those sit on our servers. Everything we point to comes from our partners across, across the US, whether it's the National Archives or the Internet Archive, right down to the, you know, the, the Northeast Wisconsin Community College. So one of the tasks I took on this summer to make sense of this moment was to reach out to our stakeholders. And you know, as, as the Digital Public Library of America, we're uniquely placed to, we talk with, a, have a range of folks in our, in our network. Um, I talked about 50 folks, including public libraries, academic libraries, you know, local and folks working locally and nationally, um, and sort of library, friends and allies and i you know I, I think the couple one area i just want to highlight and you know, there are several themes i heard but the main one is just this notion of unrelenting uncertainty right and again this is true i think for so many of us and both in our day jobs and our personal lives and they all merge together because we're all <laughs> in the same place but you know some of the terms i heard consistently from folks who was around fire drills and panic modes um you know i a month ago when I had most of these calls, I heard several people say they were unable to plan beyond two weeks. Um, I've talked, most of the folks in our network are digital first, digital leaders. I've talked to several of them whose job by and large during the summer has been about, you know, sanitizer placement and where to put the plexiglass and how to do elevator security, right? And I know a lot of you are in the middle of this. Um, I think that two week planning window in the Join last the week or two, in my experience, has accelerated to a data. As I talk to academic deans, for instance, across the US, that notion of changing plans is going from, from every two weeks to every day on a, on a spinning basis. And so that level, I guess, I, you know, owning and, re and recognizing, as, as Don laid out, that notion of the shift from physical 
did you know being either being going from being a physical uh, provider of knowledge information to 100% digital to this weird hybrid role that we've been in in the last few months is is significant. I think the mo the luckiest folks that I've talked to have been able to plan. They've seen the the reopening period as a a middle zone during which they can plan more strategically their digital engagement. In other words, how to make sure that they're using the moment, this limited moment of weeks or months where people are coming back into the door to make sure that they're creating better, stronger pathways towards uh, digital participation. Um, I guess a related quote I heard there is, I used to think that digital was the tail and now I realize digital is the dog. Right, this sort of this growing consensus, obviously, which is core to our thesis, that digital is intrinsic, uh, to, uh, intrinsic and not a nice to have to our to our practices. Um, uh, you know, the I would categorize the worries, the the weather disruption maybe is an extra one that Don mentioned, but around these three, right? So one is purely just around health and managing that. Second, the economic pressures. You know, several stake folks I talk to are either facing immediate or or, or imminent economic disruption. Furloughs uh, seem to be more common than layoffs right now. And then the you know the conversations and the social movement that really lifted up uh, in the weeks and months the Black Lives Matter movement post May 25th and the protests associated with the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others and the reckoning of that work for our institutions, for a field that traditionally has not always been at the forefront of being inclusive and equitable in practice. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're seeing that and how we're trying to walk the talk there um, in a moment and, and integrate that in all that we do. And I guess, you know, more recently, I've heard of kind of you know, three additional concerns that have really emerged just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, one is obviously just the trauma of back to school, both in terms of how our institutions respond to it and how we as humans and parents and students make that adaptation. Uh, you know, for instance, I don't, I'm not sure what my work day is going to look like in two weeks, right? It might be exactly the same. I might be adjusted to commuting to school with a child. Um, um, second, the election here uh, is obviously on folks' minds. I think the dawning you know we as we were doing our fall planning we were looking to do a major event in the middle of november we reflected and realized that election day may very well be election month and and there's you know again that's a 3 a.m wake up worry for a lot of us and then i think this growing realization of the impact of social isolation whether folks are on the introvert or extrovert scale of things and the mental health challenges that has that we had an internal staff retreat this week and you know i thought i was attuned to the degree of pressures folks were on just on their personal level and heard a lot more directly about you know what that means and been reading more about that so moving from those those let me just talk about a couple opportunities and then i'll touch briefly on what we're we're doing um i think this is the moment for those of us who work on digital and have been you know, at the forefront, I think by the fact that you're here means that you're thinking about digital infrastructure in terms of our field and our institutions. The marriage of the concerns and the questions and the conversations and the movement that have been happening around equity and inclusion and taking on racial uh, uh, reckonings, that has to be twined with access, right? When we look at the lack of access, when we look at the the sort of the digital divide being talked about in a real way more so now than I've heard it directly in the last 20 years at a broad level. We know that that's directly aligned with racial inequities in the US and I'm hearing more and more digital strategies that are being redevised in conjunction with racial inequity strategies inside of institutions. So again, it's an attempt to try to walk the talk. And that's both in terms of content, but also in how people think about going about doing the work. Equity is now a full-time job, someone said to me. Um, and so that manifested in itself in collection strategies, in how people are designing programs, both virtual and in-person programs. So things like workforce development seems to be on the top of a lot of most public library leaders I talk to's agendas. 
um, and a little more nerdy way for uh, hits a lot of our community is thinking about metadata practices and collection practices, both in terms of collection statements um, and how the work is actually done and presented. And uh, our community has actually put together a statement that now is becoming a practice ar around some of that. Um, and, and I've heard this from a couple of folks in public library land, this notion of we've been driving our agendas, especially our digital agenda from, from our main branch. And we need to think about ensure that our digital services are not just reaching, you know, sort of the 10% the who are most likely to come in and download eBooks from us, but are, are hitting everyone because that's the only way we're going to engage with our partners for the foreseeable future or the, in primary way. Um, I'll wrap by just sharing a couple, three things that are on top of mind for us as we sort of look out at the next 90 days or so in the middle of all of this unrelenting uncertainty. Um, one is with the support of Pivotal Ventures, which is a LLC started by Melinda Gates. We've been partnering with a set of collections and institutions across the US um, developing a digital collection focused on Black women's suffrage, the Black women's activist experience inside and outside of the 19th Amendment. And we're going to be talking about that work and, and sh our partners will be presenting and previewing that collection uh, on uh, Tuesday, September 8th. You could register at Bitly DPLA webinar. That, so that collection and that event is a big one for us. Um, second, We've been partnering for several years with New York Public Library, with Lyricist, and with a set of libraries across the country to present a, and develop a library-owned ebook delivery platform and service. It's called Simply E. You can download it now. Um, it's an open source library platform, and one of our roles in it is developing out a uh, set of collections, including a set of openly available books. Uh, we won an award last year for creating a, an ebook of the Mueller Report with the Internet Archive. Um, and, and so you know, that's an area we're looking to grow and develop and extend out our, our, uh, the notion now more than ever that um, the digital footprint of our, institu our, of our institutions is our institution's footprint. And we can't leave that in the hand of commercial vendors. We need to, the libraries need to be first and foremost in how we present ourselves to our, to our users, our readers, our citizens, our patrons. Last thing we're doing is to try to make sense of this is to organize a set of conversations with stakeholders around three broad topics. Um, and it, Don poked me to come up with a call for action. My call for action is a call for help. Uh, um, you know, as we begin to try to curate these and focus these conversations, you know, three things we care about. So one, reading and learning. What are we learning about how this shift to digital and the shift to virtual education, what should we be doing differently? What's the responsibility for a digital public library of America as we learn about how we learn and engage with knowledge and text? Second, what is, what can we do? And this, Don, you're actually on the list for this conversation around ensuring equitable access to, to internet and services. And lastly, uh, you know, the, the broad question of the public domain and open access. Um, we very much were founded out of a notion that um, um, the importance of openly available access to knowledge and information uh, and and we want to explore, you know, what uh, what can be done, and how can we take advantage of this moment when there's so many folks willing to, willing to rethink how they present their work and how we share this work, and the greater awareness about the vitalness of digitally available information. What can we take advantage of to to sort of ensure that the public domain re remains robust uh, in a digital context, and that if in a digital world we don't we have a more limited access to information and knowledge that would just be a dystopic outcome. Um, so that's my, that's my call to action. If you have any thoughts on how we should craft questions around those three, my hope is to over the fall to convene a set of conversations, digest them and then present them next year and, and see what we learn together as, as a community. Outstanding, John. Um, Thanks. Give us, give us an idea of, of how uh, libraries 
enter into DPLA membership, is it? And uh, what, what they're obligated yeah. to contribute uh, yeah. to go along with that? Yeah, so we do, we've got three fundamental programs. I mean, the heart of what we've been doing for our first nine years is building out a national network. The one that you see when you go to dp.la, that's largely based on a set of state-based institutions that we call hubs. Um, and and to collectively, they represent 4,000 institutions inside of their states and territories um, across the U.S. And it also includes some institutional members, folks like Harvard and National Archives, et, et cetera. Um, so one way to get engaged with your institution is through your state-based hub, which is a, you know obviously different in, in each state. Um, the second way it, that we engage with libraries, particularly with uh, public libraries and state libraries right now, is with our ebooks collaboration. Again, with our, where our partners are, New York Public Library and Lyricists and, and a growing set of others. Minitex is a key partner within that as well, uh, Khalifa and Amigos, and, um, um, and the state of Maryland. Um, and so that, that's another way that we're engaging. We have a growing number of libraries who are signing up for that to be part of that and adopt that platform. And you can experiment with that by downloading the app directly yourself, if you like. Um, and the third thing we do is we, you know, especially in this time of COVID, um, is try to host and convene and collaborate on conversations like this. Um, and so, um, you know, a, we were founded through a set of national in-person conversations that Don, I think you, and maybe some others of you participated in at various points. We do a, a in-person event. We used to do an in-person event called DPLA Fest. We're planning a virtual version of that now. And we'll, throughout the course of the fall, planning a handful of both kind of informal brown bags and more formal uh, news you can use type lessons for our community as well as broader level conversations. We do a quarterly community meeting, community board meeting, um, the last one of which uh, will feature a conversation between the Tracy Hall, the CEO of American Library Association, and John Palfrey, the CEO of MacArthur Foundation. So we try to make sure we create pathways to bring in ideas, uh, both from within our field as well as outside of our field. Right. So you have a lot of you know big time partners with these massive collections. Uh, which is a great idea to make that, you know, make those generally available. It's not just books, of course. Uh, it's a whole range of uh, cultural materials, I think. Uh, what is it that individual libraries, you know, let's say the average library size, uh, would do as far as contributing to, the, to this body? It, it, are they just developing local content? stories about their community and their history and putting that in as part of a, a wider archive or uh, how, yep. are, how are they going about contributing to the to the public library right. yep well i i see some folks who do that work on the on the participant list um i you know i think the i'll point to two things one the the black women suffrage project i mentioned very much is a prototype for us of a test approach for how we can adopt an issue specific set of collections um, and tell stories it, it you know bring together collections from across the US and be a home for one place for those stories to live right or to and kind of point to them point to our partners collections but have one one central place as a jumping off point so you can if you go to our website now you can also see a wide variety of curated collections that we've put together um, and we're trying to create that in a way that, you know, make it easier for individual institutions to contribute directly to a collection. And then I guess the second more formal established way we have is through the state-based, what we call hubs, um, which do their own process of, of intake from their partners uh -huh. and then port that up to, to us. So it makes it, you know, one-stop shopping at dp.la where you can see, you know, variety. So this week there's a lot of attention on, say, uh, black women uh, political candidate pioneers. So Charlotta Bass, the vice presidential candidate. Um, um, you know, if you go to dp.la and look up Charlotta Bass, you can see the collections from the University of Southern California's library, as well as ones that exist at, uh, say, the Library of Congress in one in one spot. Yeah. So that makes sense, of course, from the standpoint of applying metadata to standardize. I can appreciate some of the challenges involved in that. Um, 
this uh, domain you have dot la is that is that uh, los angeles or laos or wh where is that domain the good i think it's laos that's mm -hmm. a good question someone looked it up i should know that it's either laos or it's uh latvia it, no if it, it's actually if it's dot la it might be a city domain for if no, you if you we got it long enough before there was such things, so it's definitely okay. Then it's yeah. The, yeah. Then it's another country's domain. I think it's Laos. I think it's I think it's Laos. <laughs> I've been there. Uh, yeah, but that, I have too. That's, that's my last question. There's another one from from the chat, uh, John. But uh, internationally, so you've got an international domain, but you're yeah. the Library of America. So yeah, uh, uh, are you serving people outside of the U.S. or people trying to do the same thing you're doing in? America, yeah. not America. What's the international aspect? Yeah, um, a lot. So we we were formed uh, in part inspired and in collaboration with a set of projects. Europeana is probably the most prominent and dominant, the European version of DP.LA. There, we have brothers and sisters, uh, you know, in in other parts, largely of the English speaking world. So in Australia, New Zealand, um, there's a project in India. We've been in conversations with folks in, in, in different parts of the world who are beginning to start up similar projects. I would say we're uniquely American, right? Uh, uh, we are a startup. We're a small team. We're not government supported. We've gotten government grants in the past. You know, unlike our brethren uh, uh, and my friends at Europeana, you know, we don't have the level of infrastructure and direct support. We have to, we have to, we have to hunt for everything we eat. Um, and I think that's good in some degrees, like, in, I mean, obviously there are days what I, I, I envy for that, but, um, we need to be pertinent and we need to be to tell our story in relevant, immediate ways. And that's challenging, but it means we also need to do things like develop a membership program. So that hubs network I mentioned is a membership program and people pay to be part of that. The eBooks work I mentioned, you know, we, sell ebook services to libraries. We, we go out and work with publishers, build collections, and make those available to libraries in addition to making available free public domain documents. And so we are developing income to, to support our work in addition to, to the um, nonprofit grants and things that we receive. Um, so it's just to say that I think we're in, a, in, we're in a very American institution in that we're not, you know, we're, we, when I compare notes with some of my friends and family in other countries, our project is, our structure and our context is so different that, um, um, you know, we, we, we need to find our own path. Uh, first things first, as it were, right? Uh, would you post the link for that event that you mentioned? Uh, of course. Upcoming of course. in the chat. And we I'll do have a question, uh, a request from Mindy at KCPL. Uh, do you have a newsletter or a list uh, that shares these engagement opportunities? Yep, we do. I, okay. I will uh, I'll put Post both those well. in there. Yeah, okay. yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, all right. And, and I did, and Mindy is the one who caught my eye because Kansas City Public has been a uh, at least has been a partner of ours, uh, and and I've been in touch with various folks inside of Casey public and had plans to come visit before uh, back in the before times well uh, you still should if you can uh, we uh, KCPL has been uh, on and presented at one of our earlier sessions uh, they're tackling a lot of these things uh, very early on I mean things have changed over the months uh, what what strategies people are adopting and you know we're learning and we're adapting and, and, and trying to make this all work uh, I, I appreciated uh, your list of other challenges that libraries are facing. I just touched on, you know, climate driven, severe weather kind of events on top of the pandemic. But, uh, you know, there's a, it's like a cascade of crises that are coming at us uh, at, at an accelerating rate. And so adaptability has got to be number one, uh, number one attribute to get through this. So, um, uh, speaking of international, I think this is a time to move, move across the border and hear from our, uh, our uh, uh, presenter in Ontario, Stephen Abram. Uh, Stephen, thank you. Welcome. Uh, uh, tell us about, you know, how 
libraries in Ontario are, are faring and, you know, embarrass us further that uh, Canada is uh, leading the U.S. on so many fronts, uh, not the least of which are their libraries. Well, really, it's a reciprocal relationship. We're the United States' uh, largest trading partner. By far, uh, we learn from each other. So you're always going to be a little bit or a little bit ahead or a little bit behind. I've cut my teeth on being an advocate, being a, a, I'm, a, I'm a registered lobbyist on behalf of libraries in Ontario. I cut my teeth back in the early 80s when I discovered, and since then, John Walensky at UBC has proven that it takes a very small team of people to change public policy. So back in 80, 1980, 81, I was part of a small team of people getting uh, LGBTQ rights, women's rights, and uh, indigenous rights into our new constitution. So, and it was only 50 of us who were a targeted group rewriting the constitution. So after I realized it only takes a small team of people to advocate and you just need to be focused and follow certain things I've been doing. So in the US, in the 2008 meltdown, we knew that the risk was that just about every university and college was gonna go bankrupt because Americans pay to send their kids to higher ed by mortgaging their homes. You can't have 40% of homes underwater on their mortgage because they won't be able to send their kids to university. So since I was working for an academic publisher at the time, that was gonna be a disaster for us. So we worked very closely with the Obama administration and found a financial way with no increase in the US debt to invest $198 billion in making sure the universities didn't collapse. So now my focus is on what does the next normal look like and how do we lobby effectively for the role of public libraries and others in partnership with, uh, the, with the four E's, the economy, employment, social equity, and education. Uh, my insight is that we can't use those nouns. Librarians love nouns. We have buildings, we have books, we have meeting rooms. That just sucks. It's the wrong way to do it. Important operations can be described with verbs. So if you're talking about learn instead of education, learning is something people do for themselves. Education is something you do to someone. So we have a stronger society, we have a stronger society when we empower residents and citizens. So that's some of the stuff I'll be talking about today. And I'll try to go through this quickly, quickly but there'll be a longer version of these slides on my blog, Stephen's Lighthouse, and uh, I've learned over time, a couple of OCLC studies say that my blog is one of the largest and most influential blogs worldwide in our field. So I'm not saying that to be uh, bragging, I'm saying it to say that we all have influence and we can push out curated content into our world so that we play on, so that we fire on all cylinders. So my goal is to build infrastructure for public libraries that has value and influence. Because infrastructure, that's just a database, whatever, without the role of us in curating it, so it's high quality, but doing the difference between having a big data bank with data in it turning the data into information. We are not information professionals. Publishers and authors are. We can be data professionals and information metadata professionals, but we are knowledge professionals. We manage the space between information and data and knowledge. And the magic that happens between information, data, and knowledge on the paths we create. And those paths can be as minor as a libguide to as important as a community intervention on human resource capacity for digital. And then we always see that data information knowledge wisdom. If that was the path, you guys would be having a fabulous election right now with wonderful candidates and a great president in place. The wisdom does not happen because of data information knowledge on a continuum. 
what happens is behavior. And if we want to keep the knowledge ecosystem healthy, the role of libraries and major infrastructure pieces like DPLA or Internet Archive is in making sure that there is a healthy ecosystem for the creation of knowledge. Knowledge management, you can't manage knowledge. Knowledge is in humans' heads. What we can manage is how knowledge is applied to behavior, and those behaviors are things like decision making, or how knowledge is applied to public policy decisions and things like that. So the lightning rods that are between knowledge and uh, between knowledge and information and knowledge and behavior. So when I talk to the governments that I'm lobbying intensely right now, federally and provincially, uh, provinces are basically our uh, state-like uh, things in the U.S. Um, our federation in Canada allows us to look at multiple levels of government. And when I talk to them, I talk in verbs to describe what we do. And I talk in impacts and outcomes that apply to things that the government is ready to listen to. Right now, that's economic and social return on investment. So let me go through a couple of the things that we've learned around getting our gigabit thing. So like back in the late 1990s, we got a $600 million investment in putting broadband into our remote, remote and rural places. It's not finished. We need more of that. And so right now we're working with the feds and the provinces to, to move it farther. Part of it is positioning what libraries do. We're lucky if that, no, we, we know they all think we've got books. We do not need to say we've got books and resources. That's not our problem, our communication problem. Our communication problem is what our impact is and how we change things and how adaptive we are. Uh, so affordable high-speed internet should be a human right. So we're participating in that movement. We've seen it happen in the most advanced countries such as Norway and Scandinavian countries. I believe it's one of IFLA's principles that you cannot have equity of access to the economy and to our social and health infrastructures without proper internet. So we need to deal with what the government issues are. So when we've got a health infrastructure issue like we have right now, uh, we need to make sure that that human right and that spike line is there. So I talk about, yes, invest in the pipes. And so we've got major investment proposals before the federal and the provincial government right now to get the pipes in. But I never talk about the pipes without talking about what's in the pipes. The pipe set metaphor solves for three things, and it's a simple way to talk to politicians. Canada is tied together through eastern-western infrastructure with a national east-west highway system, and we built Canada by building trains from coast to coast, train tracks from coast to coast. In the 1800s, that was a solution to move grain and iron ore and our, our stuff. Now we need to build internet infrastructure to create the next economy. Outside of the Scandinavian countries, Canada is the most educated country in the world. 70% of our people have post high school uh, accreditation. That means we need to support knowledge worker jobs and understand that the jobs in agriculture, you can't shut, shut down a tree without program, you can't cut down a tree without programming a computer to cut it down now. So, and we have a lot of forests. So the pipe set metaphor solves for three things. You want your water to be fast enough into the glass. You don't want to pump for an hour to get a bucket of water so you can cook. You just want the tap to turn on and it be there. And we all take that for granted now. You need your water to be of high quality, no lead, no bad stuff. The quality continuum within information is identical to whether we feed bad myths or disinformation to people or whether we become a trusted source and we are and you need your water to be affordable and available to all obviously both of our countries many countries have issues where people don't have water and have to truck it in and whatever but we have a, a work chain that uh, 
a supply chain that, that puts that together. All of this costs money and there is no big money tree. Although we have seen the ability to drop down money very quickly lately. So we need to get rid of this attitude in libraries where we apply for $1,500 grants. I only talk in millions of dollars now because you're not gonna get an impact on a $1,500 grant. Our problem in librarianship is we've got all the proofs, all the pilots, all the experiments showing major impact. Our problem is diffusion and getting it to move through society more quickly. So we need to not have the culture of uh, poverty that libraries do and have people who speak strongly and go into the government to do stuff. And it can't just about be put a mouse on the catalog. That's not the transformational activity. The transformational activity is the promise of linked data and RDA and Bibframe and all the pieces that allow for automatic automating discovery and then us asking the questions about the racist sexist uh ai artificial intelligence adoptions that we're putting together so that we build a better normal not a uh uh normal that continues all of the uh diversity and in inclusion aspects of our past and just putting a mouse on top of a book Yes, books are great, but the majority of reading doesn't happen in books and paywalls are a problem. I've got 30 to 100,000 ebooks in every single library in Ontario because we spent government money in building that uh, infrastructure. And then we add in the Canadian content so that we're supporting culture. And then we add in the uh, magazines and newspapers and stuff so that all Ontarians will have access to that, although those in rural and remote and small town Ontario don't have enough high speed. And of course, then the pandemic hit and we're going, oh my God. Well, my advice has been stay the course. We just need to take this as an opportunity. There's no disaster that's not an opportunity. And we need to look at when our schools are reopening in September, uh, how do we make sure that the 40% of Ontarians that are going to keep their kids home can still use the e-learning options that are available to them so that they can stay registered in schools and schools get their tax dollars? But how do we make sure that some poor home that has three kids and one computer, how are all those kids going to be e-learning on stuff when mom and dad are probably working from home too? So as we all know, the, the big crisis right now is you'll notice that there are no ads for back to school laptops because there aren't any laptops or tablets to buy. The shortage is major. So that is a key barrier that we need to look at the way in Canada we used our legislation to ensure that we had enough PPE. Now we need to use our legislation to ensure that we have the infrastructure and the tools to access the economy equitably. So the world's gonna change with or without us. We need to get in front of it and think, what does the next normal look like? The flu epidemic that started in 1959 lasted until 1969. We haven't found a cure for other COVID viruses like Ebola or uh, uh, SARS or AIDS. So these, like, you know, the likelihood that we're going to, that our strategic planning horizon in libraries is until there's a vaccine is magical thinking and it's not going to work. Your five year strategy right now is this is what the world's going to look like. And we need to maintain the trust of our communities and be part of the solution to pull forward on this. So when I joined FOPL in 2013, I identified using my consultant's hat, we could not clearly define the value and impact of public libraries. We didn't know our numbers on a province-wide basis or longitudinally. We had aging public opinion data. We had issues with our capacity skills for influence. We had issues with competitive and collaborative frameworks. We had associations competing with each other instead of working together and sharing the workload. 
we didn't have the strong, we had a good relationship with one ministry in the Ontario government. Our standard approach was fossilized as events. We focused on events like conferences or a webinar instead of a long-term strategy that says, what are the events we're going to do that increase capacity for Ontario? HR capacity, our community's capacity, community-led programming. And we had an old-fashioned and uncoordinated marketing plan, which you know we know is the norm in libraries. We are not as all, there's some great examples, but we're not all the way there. So by 2020 uh, and very early on, I had lobbied the government to make all the government data on public libraries open access. So now we have, we combined it with their open data movement. Uh, it's no longer locked up in PDFs. So I downloaded all the data, which was in 17 files per year from 1996 to the present and normalized it. I hired a PhD MLS in uh, statistics, and we now have all of our data in order. So I can look at it, and then we invented through a number of uh, institutes, uh, symposia, we invented 17 key measurements that talked about value and impact. So we know all of our numbers on a log longitudinal basis right now. We know that our use is up in 10 years, 82%, but we know that our circulation plateaued five years ago. And it's the same in the uh, IMLS data in the US. We refresh our public opinion data every five years and we have a new course coming in 2021. 20, uh, we trained our members province-wide in influence and advocacy. We did a 10 part course. We also built Learn HQ which is a province-wide with over five province-wide e-learning system with over 5,000 courses in it, where we have focused strategically on BIPOC courses, anti-racism, allyship, influence and advocacy, uh, and then all the basics of management and supervision and stuff like that. So we've got them trained now. We have a very strong team across the institutional boundaries. So we all committed at our uh, library agencies, at the five uh, provincial library associations, including the Public Library Association and the Big Ontario Library Association, and at FOPL, and at the Urban Libraries Council for Canada, CULC. Uh, we now meet virtually every month or in person every two or three months, and we coordinate what our strategies are going to be and agree to three or four key things per year that we're going to work on together and each one of us takes a lead on it so that we push real hard to make sure we get the accomplishments that we need. We have very strong relationships with civil servants, the political parties, the legislature, and now it's a dozen ministries, whether it's infrastructure or finance that does the budget, or heritage and culture, or uh, education, or you know, just so Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, where our, our money comes from. Uh, all of those things, I now get invited to the table. I don't find it out and have to ask to be there. So now when the governments, I sign non-disclosure agreements all the time to seek government policy before it happens. We also have ourselves on the advisory council for the not-for-profit broadband utility for Ontario. Our big ones, Bell and Rogers and TELUS, will not put in broadband into small rural communities because they can't make a business case for it or the government would pay them, but they're also high cost. So that's why I always say affordable internet access. So now we have uh, a deep relationship. Uh, we've put a, uh, the longest street in the world is Young Street that goes from Toronto up to the end of Lake Superior. We have put black fiber cable finished this summer under the road, black fiber broadband under the road. And now we're lobbying to connect all of our First Nations reserves and all of our communities along that route, which gets us most of Northern Ontario populations. And uh, we're hoping to have that shortly. And we have a master dashboard. I spent the last three years building a dashboard, training everybody up on how to do social media marketing, building an app that supported it, 
Uh, everybody goes through 10 days training in all of our 306 library systems. And I have a master dashboard of every website and every social media account of every library in Ontario, or mo nearly all by, by population, where I can populate them. I have Facebook, private Facebook groups where we send out uh, beautiful visu visual messages on what the value and impact of library is and move it forward. We also invested in research to look at uh, we've done the, we're, we're in the second round of this now, and this is the results from the second round after the first round, where we took 50 urban, rural, First Nation, and Francophone and Northern libraries, Northern remote libraries, on what the impact of the digital services was. Who's using our computers in the libraries versus those who come in to borrow books? So we know that 53% of the people who use our computers, 25% of the people don't have access to the internet in Ontario at home or at work. 53% of the ones who use our computers are those people. And 71% of them are using it through the library's Wi-Fi. Just before the lockdown hit, I sent out uh, messaging to all the CEOs of libraries say, while you're still in your branch, point the Wi-Fi out to your parking lot and your lawn. And they did, don't turn it off leave it open with no password. Uh, we found that it increased their digital comfort. It also works like we know that Canada is a nation of immigrants and our immigrants benefit more from the library use. Uh, my wife and I are sponsoring three different families, uh, 25 people from Syria, and we supported them with our neighbors, our book club for a year where we paid all their expenses. Now they're all fully employed speaking English, uh, one has started a business. It's just amazing. Uh, and the libraries do that through their library settlement programs. And we have three branches in Toronto that uh, built huge Syrian language collections to make sure that they, they entered well. So we, we hit on all cylinders as, as we pull through this. So we look at how they use technology, what the First Nations issues are, how do we create to make things more social? Did we increase their government services use? And yes, it was huge. And patrons over 55 and low income groups were the major users of e-government. This is a government mandate. We align it with them. And the government forms and learning about government programs and services. So we'll put these slides up on SlideShare. There's a lot more here. But also we know that now we're looking at formal asks to the province that align with their stated goals. We're going to, sh we've been sharing the research reports. I've been invited three times in the last month to speak before the powerful legislative committees. Uh, we'll do the refreshment thing and, and work at and do the master chat board. So right now we're asking to leverage Ontario's broadband action forum to use public libraries as the beachhead and our partnerships with schools and municipalities to fundamentally change the opportunities since 98.7% of people are within half an hour of a public library in Ontario. And the critical e-learning support is the content in the pipes. It's all about a small committed team. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> like, you know, talk in their language, don't use jargon, don't be librarian, use verbs. Get your act together with real local independent proofs. We had ours done by major important universities. One's a Northern University, so the Northern municipalities would look, listen to it. One's the University of Toronto. Uh, we have the data, but we don't make it look self-serving. We have it run by proper academics or research institutes like the Nordic Institute or Nordicity. We hired professionals as a collaboration all the libraries in Ontario belong to my federation and they give me the money to pay for the large professional firm that has all the contents on the political level we need. And we work at speaking with one voice. When I first joined, I went and asked the government, why weren't we being successful over the previous six years under my predecessor? They said, every single one of you asks for a different thing. Can't you get your act together? So we do it together. So here's my call to action that Don asked us to do, complete the process of getting your proofs for speaking with one voice. Collaborate and get it going.
and there's more slides that follow this that I couldn't put in. So there'll be a longer version of the slides uh, up on SlideShare this afternoon. Thanks, folks. Uh, Stephen's Lighthouse there is, uh, I guess, the place to find that. Uh, Outstanding, Stephen. Really uh, excellent. Uh, your, your advocacy work as a formal lobbyist, uh, if, if people don't understand the difference there, it is, uh, you know, you're registered with the government to lobby. You're also prohibited from certain things if you're a lobbyist, but, you know, it's, it, it's a way to uh, get the message across. When, uh, 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 when John and I were at a New America conference at the State Library of California a couple of years ago, it came up about uh, you know, this advocacy point, and it, it, there's a disconnect between how popular libraries are, you know, roughly half of everybody in the U.S. anyway is a, is a library car, and yet they're constantly struggling for support. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a disconnect, and, and, and what we identified, there were like three specific subpopulations that, that don't seem to get libraries. One are the wealthier people. They, you know, they one click at Amazon, you know, what's the point? The others are, are uh, uh, technologists. They go, you mean there are still libraries around? Yeah, well, there are indeed. And, and then the third are, seem to be elected officials who may or may not be literate or advocates of literacy and somehow just take libraries for granted. And those are really valuable constituencies to, uh, to engage. Um, John, John I, I, I agree that those are worrisome things, but to, to your points, uh, people who don't have library cards are our greatest supporters, according to the OCLC research, because they are heavy readers. The millennials read more and use their libraries more than anyone else. Uh, we also, when we're talking about uh, politicians, my usual phrase I use is the responsibility for effective communication is on the communicator, not the listener. So we take an education and learning strategy with our politicians. When I'm one on one with them, which I invest a lot of time in, I can find the link and they get all excited and start to become supportive, even when they're on the very right end of the spectrum. So when I identify that someone's mother is blind, I said, did you know that the Ontario government pays for a full license on every material to support the print disabled and uh, anyone who has reading difficulties like uh, uh, e learning, learning be like, oh, what do you call it? I can't remember the right term for it, but people who have uh, reading issues. So they're allowed to use any ebook in the province for free because the province paid the license fee and it goes to the authors. So once we make connect the dots that we've actually dealt with a lot of this stuff, uh, I don't get as many barriers, but I have to hit all the key politicians and influencers and their civil service staff to make sure that uh, people don't have the wrong information in their head. Your, your point is well taken. There's plenty of evidence. It's, it's getting it in the right place, the right time, and the right way. That's the skill and the challenge. Um, one thing I'd add to your access advocacy uh, uh, about the pipes is reliability. Speed is important, uh, but it has to be reliable. And a lot of connections are, are not necessarily reliable, even if the quality so-called of the water coming through is, is clear. Uh, that's a that's a super big challenge for information and data flowing through uh, through the digital pipes. But uh, overall, it sounds like you've had great success in advocacy. I think your your notion about collaboration, aligning on 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 key talking points. Uh, uh, we set up we co-founded in the U.S. the Schools Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition around that very concept. Everybody goes in with their own agenda, their own talking points, and all the regulators and the legislators have to receive all these meetings and then synthesize them into some kind of a responsive policy if they can actually manage to understand all that. So much better if those people, and in the, the, the coalition I described, Shelby, uh, it's mostly a kind of a meta association of national associations of, of libraries and, and uh, school technologists and uh, 
and higher ed and so forth coming together to talk about these points and align on certain recommendations and then present a unified position, which opens the door every time because you're saving so much energy for the people on the other end that you want to want to influence to having to do your job of figuring out everything that's different about it. So that's, so a, that's a great team. advice there. I hope everybody takes it. We're the running healthcare. over uh, a minute or two here. Um, uh, uh, John, uh, any, any, uh, any final word here? No, just that these are, these are key, key questions. I, and I feel like we have, I mean, building down what, on what Stephen said, I feel like we have a limited window, right? This notion of the conversion and this sort of danger point at which our institutions, which are so robust, right? They're more than there are McDonald's in the US. There are more libraries, public libraries. But the danger of losing the digital engagement is, is real and the digital presence, and not just from a branding, but in terms of just actual traffic. And so that window is something that we're really focused on. And there is a scenario in which libraries become, uh, you know, which is appealing to some only physical places for where people access in where an elite and and marginalized folks will be able to access physical materials. But we know robustly, we did before, we know now five months later that more and more the way in which people are gonna be accessed, it's just gonna increase the level of digital engagement and we need to rethink our systems and practices to make sure we're serving those needs. That's interesting, you think that's a danger. Uh, I mean, it's, we were already kind of moving at an accelerating pace towards general digitalization uh, before the pandemic. And now, just judging from the stock values of the big tech companies, that acceleration has further accelerated. And we're all, like right now at this moment, interacting through digital media. Uh, it, it seems like that, uh, you know, it's an inexorable uh, trend that the, that the physical library and the, and the physical services materials are the biggest challenge in this, in this context. So, it, is there really a danger we will lose touch with digital media or it would be subsumed by all this noise? Is that, is that, I point? think the danger that's become a lot clearer to a lot of us is if we let the digital distribution go on its own, then those of us who are digital native or have the access and privilege of the devices and the pipes, I've got a nice one gig pipe right now. You know, all three of us are doing video conferencing we're going to be fine, right? It's the 20 to 40 percent of the kids in Chicago where I live who, who go to public school who do not have that, who do not have the device and not have the access. And, and I think that the, the culmination of the events of the last five to six months, uh, including driven by COVID, sort of brings home for a lot of our partners and institutions that the digital strategy and the equity and inclusion strategy can't be, are not separate conversations. And, to, and often, when we've had them, they have been, and and this notion. When I talked, you know, I think of about talking to one public library CEO. He said, "Yeah, there are three top issues for me: access, access, and access, and and what that means, and how we make that real." You know, and like a lot of us have been, this notion of digital divide has been a topic for us for twenty years more. I mean, thirty years for some of us, and and I think we have a moment now to capture public imagination um, and build practical. Uh, proposals like we've been talking about to, to really sort of drive that gap. My, my, my is well taken. It's a, it, what was a digital divide is now a digital chasm and you do not want to be on the wrong side of it. Uh, and and uh, the, what we've talked about as, uh, uh, as access is really a bit ambiguous, right? There's the, uh, uh, there's access is, is essential, but insufficient. And so there's a, a lot to it. Uh, Stephen, we're going to give you the very last word. If, if you can uh, keep it tight here and wrap us up, we will, uh, we will fade away on session 20 of the series here. Well, this extrovert talks too much, but my advice is librarians have a lot of freighted umbrella words. So we know what access means. We need to align our talking points with key government problems that are looking for a solution. So when you mentioned the health thing, 
we need to tie it directly to, like in our country, we have a very well-managed healthcare system. The US has been grieving it under the World Trade Organization as an unfair subsidy to business and that we should degrade our healthcare system because it's too well-managed. Uh, when we look at our problems in Canada, it's things like our emergency rooms are too tied up right now, especially with COVID testing. So can we understand the role of public libraries in telemedicine? Telemedicine is a fundamental trend transforming how people access stuff. So if we can keep those with chronic diseases outside of the emergency room, so that the emergency room is reserved for those with real emergencies. And we deal with the social infrastructure pieces that loneliness drives people with chronic diseases to go talk to somebody in emergency because they're lonely. And it makes your arthritis worse or it makes your MS worse or whatever. So can we put a program in place that libraries do with our print resources, our electronic resources and telemedicine sources? Can we make that work? So we got to solve a problem the government has, and many times they're driven by fiscal, but our role around talking about things like access and content isn't gonna do it. We need, we need to solve for health. All right, that's a, that's a great point, a great closing point, and one that I think opens up another conversation related to accessing services in the context of demand for those services and how libraries do it. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, before we close the recording, I'd like to ask everybody to uh, unmute, if you would, please, everybody unmute, unmute, everyone, unmute, and let's give our speakers a, a round of applause, please. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, everybody. This is fun. Thanks, very Don. Good. What a good Bye. group you've put together. Well, thanks very much. Okay, that concludes the recording.